This is the Mixed Coach Podcast, episode 105, or maybe 106. Hey guys, welcome to the podcast. You might be confused by my little intro. It's episode 106. I overlooked one podcast that we did with uh, Matt Butler when I started my podcast back up. But hey, I mean, we all make mistakes, right? That's one of the things I want to talk to you about briefly before I let you hear the interview that I did with Keith Thomas. Keith Thomas is a hero of mine. I mean, to say the least, he's one of the guys that uh, unknowingly shaped my career because I just loved what he did. If from the very first time I heard the BB and CC record called Heaven, um, I had that's when I really started digging into credits. I said, "Who did this record?" Because it's genius. And if you go back and listen to it, even now, the record is timeless. To me, it's timeless. And when I listen to it, I just get all inspired, and I want to go and learn everything, and then and then I want to quit because it's just so it's just that good. So anyway, over the last two years, Keith and I have built a sort of a relationship just mainly because I was finally brave enough to call him up and say, hey, uh, would you mind if I come and hung out with you? And he uh, graciously, you know, he, he's just a he's just a he's just a regular guy that does phenomenal, phenomenal work. And he's, uh, you know, even in in his work now and in, in his work ethic and what he does even now, I, I learn from him. But anyway, let me tell you a, a little bit about perfectionism and how it's held me back. Here's my confession, is that I did this interview about three years ago, and I did it, and I didn't want, I I wanted it to be perfect. I didn't want people to think the wrong thing of it. Um, uh, I sound like a a fanboy a little bit, uh, even though I tried not to. Um, You know, talking to Keith Thomas was like, um, you know, talking to Elvis to me and I was a little little nervous and to tell you the truth I was just afraid that it wasn't going to be perfect and I never released it and Keith if you're listening to this I'm sorry about that we you spent all this time with me uh talking on the podcast and then I never released it well it is uh, released now now so some some of the things that you may want to know is that you know this podcast is this interview is actually a few years old. So some of the things that Keith may be talking about doing, he's already done. And uh, so so I've left you some links in the show notes as well as a couple of pictures you can uh, help me make a, uh, a call on. Uh, you can even uh, make a judgment for yourself to let me know if you think uh, Keith has a uh, doppelganger. Uh, well, let's see. That That's me uh, kind of spilling my guts about imperfection and uh, embracing imperfection and just go ahead and putting things out even though they're not perfect even though I don't know if Keith would agree with that because it seems like everything he does is you know pretty near perfect but as you'll hear in the interview uh, he's got a he's got a really tight work ethic and um, and uh, it it shows so anyway here's my imperfect interview with uh, Keith Thomas Hey Keith, thank you for uh, taking some time out of your crazy schedule. It was kind of it was hard to get all of our schedules together to get this done. Uh, I appreciate you dropping by to drop a little wisdom on my on me and my mix coach guys. I really appreciate it. I have a I got a ton of questions for you, but I've narrowed them down to just the ones that don't make me sound like a giddy fan of yours, which. <laughs> I am, of course, you know, I hope you know that by now, but your career, uh, the things you've done, uh, the moves you've made in your career have totally inspired me to do what I do today. I remember listening to the first BB and CC record that you produced right down to the last thing that you've done, you know, uh, which I, Trisha Yearwood and the, and the TV series that you did, your work and your, uh, your work ethic are amazing. So thank you again, Keith, for, for coming and spending a little time with me. It was my pleasure. I'm I'm so happy to be here, and uh, you know, just look forward to spending some time with you. I know I've mentioned you to my mix coaches, my guys on my website. Can you take just a few minutes and just kind of lead us through kind of how you got started? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, well, I was born uh, into a musical family. My dad was a hillbilly musician, um, and used to play with the Sons of the Pioneers and and Boodle O'Brien. Those are uh, 
old hillbilly musicians, right? And yeah. so growing up, we were only allowed to listen to country and, and gospel music. He was a Baptist minister. And so uh, throughout, um, I, I guess, well, I made my first record when I was nine years old and then another one when I was 12. So we, we traveled as a little family group. So, you know, this was something that, that was, I was born into. And my dad, um, my dad wanted somebody in our family to move to Nashville eventually and make it in the music business. That was his, that was his dream. And so um, after graduating high school, I, uh, I went on the road for about three years playing keyboards and uh, drums for a, a Christian band. And after I got on th off the road, I, I wrote a song. Uh, this was um, 1978, I guess, 79, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, I wrote a song that I thought sounded like Ronnie Millsap. <laughs> so I, uh, I made a little demo on my Fender Rhodes and my little cassette and sent it off to Nashville and um, really forgot about it. And about three months later, I got a call from uh, his office. A guy named Rob Galbraith called me. And I'd listened on, I'd, I'd put my name on the cassette, Brian Keith Thomas, because it's my full name. And so he called me, hey, Brian, this is Rob Galbraith. Uh, he said, I was just uh, going through some tapes here. I actually threw your tape in the trash, but something made me pull it out. And I listened to it. And he said, man, I love these two songs. I'd love for you to come to Nashville. And that that started my career in Nashville. They they uh, moved me to Nashville. I became Ronnie's first staff writer, and uh, I wrote for Ronnie for about a year and a half, and had two songs on his Millsout Magic album. After that, I went over to Word Records as a um, a staff writer and a staff producer there, and, and was there about seven years, uh, and ended up having over twenty number one records while I was there. But uh, you know, one of the things that I have to say, you know, I have to thank Ronnie for is the fact that. You know, when I was at his his studio for a year and a half, he would go on tour, and I would have a state of the art studio to play in. I mean, that was it. I would spend a week doing demos, you know. And his engineer was at my beck and call, so you know, I had I I, I really hit a gold mine there when when I was uh, you know working with him, and he was so gracious to me, and and I really have to thank him for that start because otherwise I you know that's where I learned to produce. So uh, from there I went you know like I said over to Word Records. I was there for about uh, seven years, and um, in 1986 I uh, started my own production company, and then I found. Um, you know, I, I had a friend that came into town to write on a Steve Camp project, and, and uh, his name was Howard McCrary. And he said, "Hey, I'm I'm working on this show called PTL. Why don't you come out and visit me?" So I did. <laughs> and when I went out to see him, um, a little duo, BB and CC Wines, were singing on the show. So I talked BB into coming to Nashville, and uh, I told him, "I said I'm going to be leaving Word Records, but I, um, you know, I'd, I'd like to find a way to maybe do a project with you." So. I, my my goal was really to get him a deal, so I I got him to Nashville, wrote a song called "It's Only Natural," I put him on it, and pitched it to everybody in town basically, and everybody passed. And um, I remember one gentleman telling me at one of the head of the label saying, "Man, I don't hear anything. It makes me want to hear anything more." <laughs> I said, "Okay." And so you know, about a year later, that song that song won a Grammy. And after that, <laughs> things began to change for them. And um, I, I was able to place it at Sparrow in Capital and. You know, at, at that point, um, I hadn't really had any pop success, and and so the uh, first thing Capital tried to do was take me out of the picture. They wanted a black guy to produce this record, and mm -hmm. and I'll have to give it back to BB because he fought for me and said, you know, we're not doing this record unless Keith does it. And so the you know the rest is history, and and that that you know that started really my pop career. Even though it was a Christian project, that uh, that got so much attention from like guys like Ed Eckstein at Mercury, who called me to do Vanessa Williams, and then. You know, from there it just kind of uh, trickled down, and and um, Mike Blanton then called me to do um, the Amy Grant thing. Amy and I wrote a song called "Baby Baby," and that became her her first pop hit. And so, you know, from from the you know through the '90s, I had quite a run. I was um, I, I I did a production deal with Sony uh, in the mid '90s, or actually it's 1998, and um, you know I had a good run there. And and then in 2002, I went through a I had a little setback, went through a divorce, took three years off, and um, when I came back, the industry started to to kind of fall apart, and I decided then at that point I would uh, maybe start an artist development company, and that's what I've been doing for the last five or six years. I will tell you, uh, 2002 um, is one of those things when when I had that setback. I had just signed Katy Perry, mm -hmm. and I had just auditioned the Kings of Leon, which were the Follow-Up Brothers at the time. Oh. Oh, man. And uh, another little girl named uh, Erin McCarley, who I actually adore, and they were going to be my launch artist. Mm -hmm. And 
um, you know, we hadn't done any paperwork with with Aaron or or the follow up brothers, but we had signed Katie, and we we're you know moving forward on on that project. But you know, everything kind of fell apart, and um, so I just kind of did a reboot and came back in 2005 or 2006, I think it was, and uh, you know started doing the artist development thing. So that's kind of where we are now. I'm actually in the process of. Uh, having my own label, having my own shop, so that's what I've been working on for the last year, trying to get that funding together, and and we're really, really close on that. Wow, wow! Uh, I di- I didn't know you were starting your own label. That's cool. Um. <clears throat> but we'll see. You know, the the uh, the success rate is not that great <laughs> for independence. <laughs> but listen, I will tell you, I've I've been blessed. I've had um, the opportunity to work with a lot of great talent over the years, and I've. You know, I've aided and art a lot of projects that I didn't get credit for. You know how that goes, and then then I've I've, de- I've identified so many acts that have gone on to sell millions of records, and I've got right now four artists that I really really believe in, and um, you know I'm excited. You know, and so we'll just try to try to get it all together, put the right team together, and, and see if it works. You know? Well, I know who some of those artists are. Uh, one is Celica Westbrook, right? That's right. <clears throat> yes. Yeah, I I uh, signed <laughs> I signed Selick when she was 14 years old. I met her when she was 11. She came and auditioned uh, in my studio, and I said, "Boy, I think you're great, but you know, it's just not ready yet." So I said, "Check back in with me periodically," and which she did. And uh, when she came back when she was 14. I was like, "Wow, you know, this is ready." So we, you know, we started. This was in August, uh, you know, five years ago almost, and um, put her in the studio. And within six months. I had uh, I had done a joint venture with Neo, and um, uh, together we uh, you know got her uh, an audition with L. A. Reid in New York. L. A. offered her a deal on the spot with a Justin Bieber tour and duet. <laughs> and so I left New York thinking that day, wow, that was easy, you know. But uh, you know, after eight weeks, we got our deal back, and there were some things in the contract we just couldn't live with. So we passed on that deal, and that was a tough one because. Wow. You know, we took her out of school, and she was getting ready for the tour and all that good stuff. So it was it was a big pill for her to swallow to have to go back to school and tell, you know, her friends that you know I'm not going to be on the Bieber tour. You know, oh wow, a t- yeah, that's yeah, that a, heart- be a heartbreak. Yeah. Well, hey, uh, I know you mentioned uh, Ronnie Millsap, and you know, I was looking over your Wikipedia article, and, and I remembered after I read it that that uh, Ronnie was the guy that brought you to town. Besides Ronnie, are there under, other any uh, big influences, uh, you know, guys that you hung out with or guys that maybe that you followed uh, in your career that changed the course of what you're doing today? Well, I'll tell you the person that really changed everything for me, uh, it really wasn't even a music person. You know, I grew up in a really poor environment. We didn't have uh, hot running water or inside a bathroom till I was 13 years old. Mm. And so uh, I used to talk just like this, I mean, you know, from Conyers, Georgia, <laughs> you know, and I'm not kidding. And so my, there was a teacher named Linda Wise in my high school and she heard me sing at uh, a talent contest and she talked me in to joining the drama club. And so I did. And she began to be uh, like my mentor, and she taught me how to put endings on my words. And, and, and at the end of the day, by the time I was graduating, I went from like a D average to straight A's. You know, she just took, she invested her time and energy in me. She saw something in me and, you know, actually helped me get a scholar, an acting scholarship, which I, you know, turned down regretfully now. But, um, you know, it's one of those things where she saw something in me that no one else did at the time and I I go she taught me so many things and gave me so much and um, you know where I am right now I still use some of the techniques that she taught me back in the day you know and so that that took me to another level and and so I began this journey uh, trying to to, you know figure out really what I wanted to do and I really wanted to be an actor I really did I I I felt like that was one of the things I didn't know I could do and it became it was an easy thing for me but uh, my dad went to one of the rehearsals at uh, the Alliance Theater in Atlanta with me and some things happened you know how theater can be it's pretty uh, risque and so he uh, you know I got back home he says you're not going to New York you're not gonna go up there and act and I said okay so I went on the road with the Christian band of course yeah. and um, I'm not so sure that <laughs> is not as bad you know <laughs> Yeah. But, uh, you know, so then I, you know, I started, I'm like, I'm, I moved to Nashville with Ronnie and, and we did that whole thing. And, you know, one of the, one of the guys that, that I guess has probably been the most influential in my music uh, career has been David Foster. You know, he was one, always one that I, 
I loved his music. I uh, somehow connected myself to him, and and you know that that one day when I got a call from him saying, "Hey, I'd like for you to help me work on Symphony Sessions or whatever," one of those albums mm-hmm. that he was doing. That was the day for me that I go, "Wow, okay," you know, and and I will never forget that. And um, you know, I've worked with him many times in the studio now, and and have learned a lot from him. And you know, that's it's it's kind of one of those things where you get to meet the guy that you really idolized, and 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 he becomes your mentor. That's that's the best right there. Yeah. Yeah. So, how cool! Yeah, I, I didn't right. realize that you worked with uh, with David. I knew that you had played on uh, a record of his, but uh, so you, you did string uh, we, arrangements uh, or what? Well, uh, programming, basically uh-huh. programming in the studio, and, I, and there were some other records. I can't, you know, re- recall what they were, but there were a couple of sessions that I did with him, like doing programming, keys, and, and drums, and that sort of thing. And you did that in L.A. or in Nashville? We did it in Nashville. Okay. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. He and Herberto came to Nashville, and we did some stuff here. Oh wow. Yeah. Uh, what's it like working with Humberto? Oh, man, he's a doll. I love him. Um, um, he just, um, you know, he's one of those guys that's just so easy to, he's, it's it's refreshing because he's so easy to work with. And, and um, you know, you, you turn over to him. He's probably one of the only guys that I could turn something over to and just feel comfortable that he's going to do the right thing. You know, I'm, I'm right. very much hands-on about everything I do. <laughs> and uh, you know, it's one of those things where I, I feel comfortable with him. Yeah. I haven't worked with him in a, in a while, but um, you know, I, I I love him and you know, total respect for his work. Well, when I was in California this past week, uh, the producer that I was working with mentioned a David Foster song as being the epic orchestra sound, and Humberto did it. I forget the name of the record it was, but it was a phenomenal uh, Andre Bocelli, I think. It was a phenomenal uh, sound. I was just thinking that's something to aspire to. Uh, for engineers, anyway, but um, it, yeah. so were there any uh, follow, kind of following up on uh, the production side of what you do? Were, are there any um, like aha moments where you just kind of you 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 crossed a threshold or you figured something out that you started applying and then things just kind of started to fall into place? Was there anything like that? Well, I mean, as a producer, yeah. I mean, there was a point where I, it finally, you know, in the beginning, as all young producers do, um, you're really trying to get people to take you, for, take you seriously, and, and you're trying to put your stamp on things. And in many ways, um, some of the earlier artists that I produced, I felt like that maybe I was the artist instead of the producer, uh, instead of the artist, you know, themselves. Mm-hmm. But what I learned over the years. Um, was that my job as a producer is really to um, make sure that the artist is, um, you know, to identify what their strengths and and are, and to be able to be a supporter of them, and that that became really my driving force. Is like I I I tried to be. Um, you know, I'm behind the scenes anyway, but I try to be that person that that you know gives them everything they need to be the best that they can be, and it's not about me; it's about them. And mm-hmm. and so I, I think that might be a part of the reason why I've been able to do so many different genres is because I I connect myself to whatever they are, and that and I think that that is also part of the theater background that I have too, because mm-hmm. I learned how to adapt and you know, and I can I can attach myself to those kind of projects, and so. You know, I've had records in classical. It's a funny story. I did uh, Charlotte Church record, and this is this is um, gosh, back in I guess it was ninety. No, no, it was two thousand one. I think I did the Charlotte Church record, and I don't read a stitch of music. So I'm sitting on the floor with the uh, London Philharmonic, and one of the guys, one of the guys asked me about a chart, and he's showing me these notes, and I'm going. You know what? I I just gonna, I'm gonna have to hear it. I can't I can't read that. <laughs> he was like, "That's you can't read." So you know, it's like you play it for me. I can tell you where 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 it needs improvement or what the problems are there. But it was like I you know it was a funny thing. So fast forward to even like a couple of years ago, Charlotte's doing a new record, and um, I got a call from a guy named Mike Dixon uh, uh, in in London, and you know we were talking about me doing this record, and she wasn't sure about me producing the record because she wanted a pop producer to do the record she didn't want another classical producer and I'm going I'm not a classical <laughs> producer. that's the only classical record I've ever done you know right. so it's kind of funny but but you know I, I have been blessed with that ability to be able to adapt myself to many different uh, genres and even to country to pop to R&B that sort of thing you know so well one of the things I learned about you uh, first of all let me let me do two two rabbit trails here first of all you said you were uh that you probably should have gone into acting. Have you ever seen this show, Royal Pains? I have not. They're the main character on Royal Pains could be your stunt double. 
Oh, you, no. You, yeah, you should check it out because I've thought about, you know, just tweeting you or texting you or something like that to say, hey, is this you, Keith? Because okay. he, he looks like he, he could go he could go as your brother for sure. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write that down. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. The Royal Pains. It's a great show, too. But uh, cool. let's see. So l- let me ask this. Um, oh, and the other rabbit trail I was going to go down is a few years ago, I got to come and hang out with you, which was absolutely one of the pinnacles of my of my life because uh, you uh, you honestly have no idea how much I studied oh your goodness. work and I just I guess I had this thing in the back of my mind that everything that you did you just sat down and you sat down behind the keyboards and you turned everything on and you just touched things and that uh, heaven record just came out of your speakers and 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 I don't know I, I guess that was just my artist uh, mentality way of thinking that that it, it does that actually comes easy for people and and then I, I didn't realize until after I got to hang out with you a little bit that you actually work really really hard on on this stuff. And I remember one thing that stuck with me forever. You said, uh, you know, because I think I told you that, and you said, yeah, once it gets out there, you can't get it back. Right. You know, talking about a mix or a production. And I remember I remember uh, you were mixing and you listened to the mix, and I think it was on a Heather Headley record. You listened to the mix, and you went back, and you changed the p- the whole piano part. Which, and, and I thought, wow, I, I don't even think I'm in the same league as Keith Thomas because I, oh, I thought yeah. it was amazing. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Uh, but anyway, you, know, so, you know what? It is it is work. I I uh, and part of it's probably my own OCD. You know, it's like yeah. uh, it has to be a certain way before I can let it go. But uh, yeah, I mean, I it is work, and and you know, I'm always trying to to try new things and do it differently, um, and you know, it's just one of those things where I've always done that. As a matter of fact, there used to be a, a time when I wouldn't use the same sound twice. I can't do that anymore because it's just like we have to work so quickly, right? You know, these days. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that's one of those things that I, w- I always said too that that this is work for me. Where acting wasn't, I could just go do that. You know. Well, it seems like I heard an interview that you did or a magazine article that you were in, and you were talking about how when you were working, I guess it, maybe it was with um, Amy Grant or Vanessa Williams. I can't remember, or it might might have been Selena. I don't, I'm not even sure. But you were talking about maybe you'll remember this. You were talking about how when you get a performance out of a person, you tell them to act out the part and to become the the person who is singing the part and, and how that be- translates to tape. And I guess that's from your acting uh, background, right? Well, I mean, part of yes, absolutely. And that's one of the things I was saying earlier that uh, yeah, I still use a lot of the techniques that I learned from Linda Wise. But, you know, because the first thing out of your mouth is the first, you know, that's the most important thing when you're, when an artist is singing, that's, you're, you got to capture their attention with whatever it is it's, you're singing, like the verse or the chorus or whatever. But it's also, you know, you've got to emote in a way that makes it interesting. And, and that's kind of, that's, you know, one of those things that I do when, when I'm doing a vocal is that I, I give them scenarios to sing and put them in a, I, I will put them in a video in their mind, you know, and ask them to act it out or sing it and, and pretend like they're watching the video as they're singing and sometimes you get some amazing things like that you know it depends if, if the artist is if it depends if the artist is willing to play along with you right some some of them uh, you know they don't like look I'm gonna, I'm gonna just sing it my way and be done you right. know but uh, I have a funny story like Vince you know at Vince Gill we were doing the one of the Amy Grant records and it was that was my first time in the studio with him so he you know he's a country guy he sings at first take and that's it right yeah, right so I was working the vocal man I was like pouring it on and working him and like and I'm you know make me believe it that sort of thing and he said excuse me you know just like <laughs> and it's on camera you know it's like oh my god so you know but yeah you know we've we've uh, we've gotten past that since we've gotten to know each other well but it's one of those things where some artists don't really understand that and don't really care to go down that road but uh, most of the times when I get really really great vocals it's it's because we've spent time experimenting and, and leaving all the inhibitions behind you know just going and doing what feels right and you know finding parts of the voice that they didn't even know they had mm-hmm. yeah you you can tell it in in the stuff that you produce for sure and I, I have to say that I've I've actually when I read that and I started listening to some of the stuff that you produced I actually started implementing that into the way I produce too so oh, cool. uh, I've, I've, I've learned more than you know from you so Hey, let me ask you this. I've noticed that you are pushing or are active in this thing called Far Further. And I and I was wondering if you could explain to me exactly what that is. Absolutely. Uh, my partner, Lauren Ballman, um, who is my not only my partner, but he's my dear friend. I love him dearly. We uh, uh, About five years ago, he came to me with this idea um, and... Um, 
it was about really it was about having this uh, portal, this new portal for um, for the music uh, business. It's like it would be more like uh, a wiki meets uh, Facebook or MySpace at the time, you know. And um, but over the years, it's kind of morphed into this new uh, this new thing. Basically, dot music is going to be uh, a new domain. And uh, this is this is Lauren's brainchild, so I can't really take. He's the brainchild of all this. I can't really take credit for it. I just, I, I, I believed in it enough that I went out and helped get funding for it, and I'm involved in the, uh, in, in the, in the, as a founding member, and you know I'll be involved in the company because it's got so many different levels to it. But we're, uh, we're hoping that um, you know every musician is going to want their own identity worldwide. Mm-hmm. We, we feel like the labels will want to switch over from .com to .music. And um, so you know, you know, from now on, maybe you'll see Universal dot Music instead of dot com. That's that's the that's the thing. And so you you'll do your paid subscription. You'll get free websites, that sort of thing, without giving too much away. Right now, um, we are um, we are hoping to find out in the next month or two if we actually have been awarded the domain. But it's been a five year process and a lot of uh, hard work on Lauren's part just to get this uh, this far. Well, wow, that's some big thinking, man. To 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 have your own uh, domain. I mean, right. your own. What would you call it? The uh, the dot music would be. Yeah, it, it is a domain, and you know, and, and it's basically uh, the the number one criteria for for getting the domain is having the community. And if you go to the farfurther dot com, you'll see that we do have the community mm-hmm. uh, worldwide. So we feel good about it. We love the idea. We we love the idea of giving back to the musicians and and creating a community where uh, the community can talk to each other. Mm-hmm. You know. And uh, every musician, like I said, will I think will want their own identity. Right. Is, is there anything that my listeners may could do to maybe further, far further that along? No. You know, it's in the final stage, from what I gather. Um, and so Lauren has been, like I said, working diligently on this, and uh, we're just kind of waiting now for the decision to come down. Yeah. I do have one more question for you. Really, is relevant to anybody in the music business. But if you can kind of gear it toward guys like me, maybe guys who mix and who are starting to produce. If you were brand new to the music, to the current music business, the way it is now, what would you do in the next few weeks? Well, I mean, to, right now this business is all about relationships. It's about connectivity, and so I would, um, you know, I would, I would try to hang with as many people that are doing it as you could. Get involved any way you can. Um, and start building your online presence, you know, because that's that's what's going to be driving. I think everything three to five years from now, as we know, the uh, the, the whole download system is going to be uh, obsolete, and it's going to be it's all going to be about streaming. And the way you're going to be able to get your 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 number of plays up is you're going to have to have your own fan base. You're going to have to have people that will support you. And the more streams you get, obviously, the more money you make. So I would just start by, uh, you know, first of all. You know, upping your, uh, amping up your social network. But um, in terms of like, um, you know, w- what to do right now, I think just connecting with people and, and learning from them and getting involved. Write, co- do as many co-writes as you can. Or, or and, and for me, you know, it's like sometimes you might have to do things for free to be able to get that next step. You know. Mm-hmm. But, uh, mm-hmm. I did that back in the day. I started out. I did so many free sessions. I can't even tell you. You know. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> me too. Yeah. So, sometimes you can't even put a price tag on what you can learn at, at stuff you do for free. That's or stuff right. You have to pay for it. It's, it's it's stuff that so shapes your career that you that you can't even put a price tag on it. So. Hey, Keith, thank you. I, I know you're busy. You've got a songwriting thing going on now, and you've taken half an hour to chat with me today. And again, I appreciate it. Absolutely, looking forward to it, Kevin. Thank you so much. So there you have it. See, it wasn't so bad, was it? It was a it was a pretty good interview after I listened to it, and uh, it's, uh, maybe I didn't sound that nervous. But anyway, it was a it was an honor and a pleasure to uh, to get to talk to Keith and to find out a little bit about uh, how he works and what goes on inside that uh, head of his uh, when he's producing hit records. Uh, so anyway, um, if you guys wouldn't mind, if you like in these podcasts, go to the iTunes store. Uh, give us a good rating and some, or give us a rating, an honest rating, and some feedback. I'd love to hear it. Uh, it'll help us appear uh, further up the line. And uh, and I've left you some show notes. If you go to mixcoach.com and search for Keith Thomas, you'll see the show pop up, and there's some links in there that you can uh, that you can you can even see the picture of uh, of Keith and his doppelganger. Okay, uh, Mark Furstein. So anyway, 
Uh, that's it for this edition of the Mix Coach Podcast. I appreciate you listening, and uh, I'll see you next time. Okay, bye.